Hello, Justin. Hi, Matt. How are you? Doing great. Welcome to the DMZ. That's I know that uh, you've been on Blogging Heads many times, but first time on the DMZ. So for those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about you. Absolutely. Uh, I am Justin Green. Uh, I am a former intern of yours, Matt, at The Daily Caller. I now um, edit and contribute to a blog at The Daily Beast. My boss is David Frum. Excellent. And uh, for those who are interested in that transition and uh, your, your sort of career and, and going from interning here at The Daily Caller to uh, editing David Frum and, and blogging at The Daily Beast, check out, you were on my podcast, The Matt Lewis and the news podcast about a month ago, and we, we hashed that out. So uh, check that out. But I want to talk to you about some more timely stuff. And first, uh, I'll be self-indulgent and talk about my latest post at The Week, which is about the upcoming nerd prom and the White House Correspondents' Dinner. I argue, Justin, that the geeks have inherited the earth, um, and... It's true in many, many facets of life, but, but especially noticeable in journalism, where uh, the people who run D.C. were once probably the same people on the receiving end of wedgies. But uh, I know you had have, you have some differences on the piece. I'd love, love to hear them. Well, I, I sort of think that people who run D.C., people who um, are, gravitate toward covering politics rather than uh, directly being involved in politics probably was, always were on the receiving end of wedgies. Sort of personality that makes you want to to like dig through a political report or to go find a hidden nugget of information that people might be interested in or to I don't to to wait outside a congressman's office for hours just to get a a couple uh, questions in for a, a potential story. Those are the kind of people who I think are have probably long been nerds. I haven't been here in DC long enough to to be able to verify that anecdotally, but from the personality, yeah, like, like it seems like that makes sense. Well, it's like the difference between people who become baseball players and people who write about baseball and and dig through you know the statistical analysis of baseball. It's right. Really well, and something to note about that though is that I, I personally think that people who never played baseball or who played it only a little, but who really love the game, are far better writers about the game because they they, they appreciate it from the perspective of of a viewer as compared to from, from watching the game, from having played the game itself. It's, a, it's, um, it's perhaps so different that and it, it's so stripped away of some of the inside stories that people can actually make sense of it. And it's, it's far, I think it's far more helpful. So, but okay. So it sounds like you agree with me then that, uh, DC, that, that DC is a power city. And, um, at least in terms of the journalist side, the people who are focused, you know, sort of, celebrated and, and and see I, I see this as an analogy to high school right like at your high school prom the prom king is is you know the football player but the nerd prom as it's affectionately called um really celebrate this this is nerds op opportunity to uh rule the school and um i think that there is this proliferation of people and this got cut out of my piece because it's controversial <laughs> so of mm. course I'm going to talk. Of course I'm going to talk mm. about it here. Um, but there is somewhere on the Asperger's spectrum, some of these folks fall, and some of them have have talked about this, have written about it, have blogged about it. Uh, I'm a huge fan of of, uh, of Dr. Sheldon Cooper and uh, the Big Bang Theory, and of course you know uh, it's about a group of physicists in uh, Southern California. But frankly, I think the show could have just as easily been about a group of bloggers living in DuPont Circle. Uh, perhaps. It's a, well, you know, you're, I mean, okay. Well, sort of, like, so the perspective I have of the White House Correspondents' Dinner, um, which I, I think probably deserves more mockery than anything else, um, is that it's the, the, like the star of the show, even though he'll get made fun of some, is still the president, who is who kind of earned the wrath of nerd culture for his, I mean, you mentioned the, the Jedi yeah. mind meld, um, comment which a lot of my a lot of my friends in journalism were i don't know if they were upset at him or just dismayed that he so badly mangled a reference to star wars and star trek right but the important unpardonable sin i think right so but like despite the fact that it is in fact like the, that you can call it a nerd prom the the star of the show is still someone who is very clearly not a nerd well i don't know i don't know there, there's the cool side of obama 
Um, and then there is a sort of Urkel side to Obama. Have you seen that picture of him riding that bike? So, <laughs> yes. and he's and he's wonky. I mean, he is kind of wonky. And, and I mean, there there are different types of nerds. Um, and uh, so I think that he is sort of a, a wonky president. Clearly, that's probably true. But I, it's, by a, a similar sense, Bill Clinton's kind of a wonky president too. Yeah, I think I think, Clinton, I think you might call him a nerdier guy because he doesn't he doesn't really seem to be terribly athletic either. Well, I think it's all subjective. I, I think that, that uh, Bill Clinton certainly was a wonk and certainly was smart, but I think he, he had more of a uh, jock persona, whether or not he was athletic. I mean, do you, you remember know? that picture of him and Al Gore and their little walking, perhaps the most d disgusting picture that I've ever seen? <laughs> uh, Clinton and Gore, and they're just covered in sweat, and these shorts that have surely been banned since the 90s, but oh. Well, fair enough. Um, I encourage everyone to read it and uh, sound off in the comments. Uh, but I believe, my argument is that the geeks have inherited the earth, that we once mocked nerds and they now run the world, and politics is merely one example. We could go into Bill Gates and, and uh, all sorts of things. But let's move on to uh, some maybe more pressing issues, or at least... Uh, substantive issues. Um, and let's talk about immigration. You know, Senator Rubio has uh, been sort of uh, you know, taking the lead and trying to sell immigration reform, what some people call shamnesty, um, <laughs> to, to, conser to conservatives. Um, and it, it seems to me that this week was a turning point that, um, well, I don't want to say a turning point. And I don't want to say that it's like, uh, that's not, that I don't want to say that it's game over, but it does seem to me that this week was the week when a lot of conservatives sort of turned against him. Um, am, am I, is this overwrought, Justin, uh, or, or I, I don't think so. Point? Well, th this week he lost Rand Paul, didn't he? Well, he had an excuse, and Eric Erickson also had, you know, uh, people are legitimate or not. I mean, Rand Paul blamed Boston. As, you know, we need it's prudent to now step back and look at security measures. So, but yeah, it, it's it's not a good thing if, if you're Rubio. Yeah, I'm I'm not personally a big fan of of trying to make much out of Boston. We have the, I mean, no matter how you really look at it, one of the two was a was an American citizen, and and they came up, and the younger one came here as a nine year old boy. So there's. I, I'm not terribly sure there's much we could do with a system other than just banning people from certain regions or from saying that if you have young boys in your family, they can't come here or a, a host of incredibly unpalatable things that I, I'm not sure that we really ought to consider as, as perhaps a, um, immigration policy. Uh, it has been sort of, um, I don't know if, if you want to say amusing or sad to watch the what people have been calling the conservative civil war, to see the the people who who yes uh, term immigration as shamnesty or say that or used the I think Breitbart used the Marco phones thing or right. or or publishing the emails of people who are typically your political allies or or your, at least your ideological allies. It's been a kind of a bizarre to see the way it's it's unfolded or of, of Rubio saying that well, Rubio's camp is suggesting that that the opponents of immigration reform are, are similar to those who would have opposed who would have been in favor of slavery. I and mean, there's been some some nasty, some nasty splintering here, and it's, I don't, I don't think it's good for the conservative movement or for the Republican Party. I talked with, um, in in the run up to this, I, you know, had in the past years actually, I've had you know, meetings with different Rubio folks, and they always said that they expected this to get nasty, but I, I, I doubt they expected that it would be. I, I assume that they underestimated how extreme the pushback would be. This issue is so divisive. And I think that, first of all, let me just preface by saying, I believe that there are entirely legitimate concerns with the bill. Anytime you have an 844 or whatever page bill, there are going to be things in there that, uh, that are problematic. We're going to talk about one of those here in a minute, mm -hmm. uh, the Obamacare thing. But there's going to be amendments, and it's going to have to be hashed out. So I don't want to get into the weeds too much, but there certainly are legitimate concerns and criticisms of 
of the bill. Uh, having said that, I do think that there's something scary about immigration for a lot of people. And I think that it's an emotional thing because no matter what your problem is in life or what you're afraid of, you, you could blame immigrants for it. I mean, if you can't find a job, someone could, you could say that it's because of immigration. If, if you're afraid of crime, you might be led to believe. You know, there's so many, it, it's a very easy issue to demagogue and to fear monger, in my opinion. Um, and it doesn't mean that all the fears are unfounded. I mean, but, but I do think that, um, that it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's the kind of thing where if people are on the fence leaning toward immigration reform, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a pushover to scare them back off the fence. Uh, perhaps, I, 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 I think I share your, your general feelings about the bill itself. It's a big bill and it tries to accomplish a lot of things. There are obviously going to be some things in it that we think are good, uh, some that are less so. It, we'll, we will have to work with that. I, I think it was a, a big mistake for I suppose watching some of Rubio's office's responses to these attacks and, um, and looking through some of the language, it looks like m much of the language originated with Schumer's office, not Rubio's, which I find problematic. It's one of those where I'm not sure why Rubio attached himself to immigration. I'm not going to, uh, psychoanalysis is not my thing. I don't think I'd be terribly good at it. Uh, but for, for whatever reason, it, he's put himself in a, in a very suppose, like, awkward situation and one that's going to be, have massive Potential well, follow-up for his political career. If Rubio, I think this is a profiling courage for him because I I believe that he thinks this is the right thing to do. But if he want, if his goal was to be president, this is not the advice he would have given him. I would have said, give great speeches, uh, but don't do anything. Don't do anything controversial. Certainly not anything that could possibly scare the base off. Uh, let someone else. You know, the the pioneers take the arrows, right? Let let somebody else propose things, and if it's popular with the base, then support it. And, and as soon as people turn against it, you start sniping at it. I mean, but if you look at the way Barack Obama managed to become president, it certainly wasn't by, if he was a senator, and it certainly wasn't by pushing, authoring landmark legislation <laughs> or accomplishing anything in the Senate. Um, and uh, so I think that, you know, Rubio... I believe is doing something for all the right reasons, and, and he believes it's the right thing to do. But it certainly called, it's certainly not the political advice you would have given him. You would have said, give good speeches, but don't do anything, don't make any waves. Um, be, be for what's going to happen, kind of thing. Be, do what's popular. Mm -hmm. yeah. Should we go into the weeds a little bit? Well, yeah, I think that. Uh, there, you know, anytime you have a, a bill this big, right, so there's always, like, unintended consequences, and uh, a very interesting one popped up last night. Why, why don't you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, so I think the, the first person I saw reporting this was Jed Graham at Independent Business Daily, um, which is basically that the bill um, says that employers won't be required. In the simplest language, it's that people who have provisional status, who are allowed to stay in this country but are not citizens who are on that sort of 10 to, 10 to 13 year path uh, won't be given access to, to the benefits of Obamacare. In other words, employers also won't have to provide them with Obamacare benefits. And Jed calculated this is about a $3,000 a year difference for employers. And that makes it basically an, a subsidy for employers not to hire citizens, to instead hire people who will be here legally working, who won't be, they won't be violating any laws. But what it uh, sets up is a, a strong incentive for employers not to hire citizens, instead to hire provisional workers. Right. And here's something that the Rubio forces put in. You know, they, they certainly pushed immigration reform to the right um, compared to what it might have been, what it has been in the past. And they insisted on uh, that, that, that people who are legal but not yet citizens would not be eligible for Obamacare. Which sounds like something conservatives should love, but it's sort of like a Rubik's Cube. You know, you, you move one thing and then something else gets out of balance. Um, and, and by doing that, they've now created the situation where employers would be incentivized to hire people in that provisional status as opposed to American citizens. Um, 
it's something that they can work out on, that they'll have to find a way to work out. But it I'm not shows... so sure they can. Uh, so the sort of problem is that if conservatives now decide that they need to push the requiring uh, requiring everyone to be covered by Obamacare, basically stripping out that subsidy, that's going to be seen. I think from the very far right as an endorsement or at least an acceptance of Obamacare. So I, I'm not sure where you I, – I, I simply – I think the, the problem now is that any move that fixes this, that makes a better policy, that that prevents us from creating a, like a two-tiered employment labor force, anything right. that tries to make it better is going to probably lose votes rather than gain them. So – Well, that I agree. I think that, the, that it's a huge political problem, and aside from being – well, isn't every problem political? <laughs> well, but aside from being a, a substantive political problem, it also is is hurtful because it, it, it also reinforces the notion these guys don't know what they're doing, these guys don't know what's in the bill, the bill's too big, there's all sorts of consequences that we're going to discover, you know, you have to pass the bill so we know what's in it kind of thing. So mm -hmm. this this is um, is very damaging or potentially very damaging to the cause. And by the way, I wrote about this at the Daily Caller this morning. Politico is interestingly writing uh, sort of a series of posts warning conservatives against supporting immigration reform. I don't know if you've seen this, Justin. Well, it's it, in there, broadly speaking, it, it's, it's correct. There's a, a piece we'll be publishing later this morning, which the basic thrust of it is that a very primary concern above all else for conservatives, above the above the economic growth, above um, how we how we deal with um, political answers is is simply uh, our new arrivals. Are they assimilating? Are they quickly reaching the um, the achievement status uh, of native borns of other recent arrivals? Are are we um, are we managing to assimilate our citizens as we historically have? And that the the problem seems to be with the, with the most recent arrivals who are predominantly Hispanic. Is, is the answer is no. And it's not simply a first or second generational problem. It's also it also reaches into the third generations and beyond because after you have your initial assimilation, after we after we deal with the problems of learning English, of, of starting to to get some educational attainment, you hit the problem of they become Americans. They the, they're stricken by the, the basic the, the problem which hits Americans in our our own life, which is the breakdown of the family, and. A broken down family is more is, is far more likely to rely on the government for things that ordinarily would be provided for by a family. And how do you think people who increasingly rely on the government are going to vote? Right, uh, that's a legitimate problem, a legitimate concern. Um, I would say uh, a few things. One, before I forget, Mickey Kels and I just debated this. Uh, on my podcast, so check that out. And obviously, I bring those Mickey from uh, blogging heads here anyway, but uh, we talked about it on the podcast, Matt, Matt Lewis Show podcast. Um, I think that uh, a, a few things about those concerns. One would be um, sort of substantively, I, I'm skeptical of the notion that um, that these concerns are unique or original to Hispanic immigrants. Um, when we look back at what was said about, say, immigrants from Eastern Europe, for example, many of the same concerns and, and skepticism uh, was voiced by, by Americans at the time. And we saw that over time they did assimilate and in fact become more likely, you know, Reagan won, you know, the Italian vote, the Irish vote, um, the Catholic vote, um, what, what used to be called the ethnic vote. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, maybe Hispanics are different. I'm, I'm, I'm more skeptical of that than, than others. Um, what I would time. say is that I would, I would try to, to look at it not as a, um, what is what the ethnic group is, is, is what the time is instead. Um, most of the, the groups that you described earlier arrived from the early night, from the, in the late 18th or in the early 19th centuries, a time when we had, uh, it, it, sim most simply put, when it was very easy for someone to arrive here reasonably poor 
and with a with a low levels of educational attainment and through hard work and through forming a family and through doing all the right things to uh, become at least moderately successful in life and perhaps to it to become quite successful and it was relatively easy for your family to assimilate it was relatively easily for the second generation to do even better than the, than the first I, I don't think most people would disagree that those basic problems, th those are things that we face now today that are not as easy as they were 100 years ago. They're not as easy as they were 50 years ago. And realistically, they're not as easy as they were 30 years ago. So the question is is less about like who is coming here than what country are they coming to. And the country they're coming to is is one that is um, more stagnant, one that has a bigger government, one which in which we have a, a, a real problem with the American dream. That That's the way I would try to frame this debate. I, I, I don't think it I'm not sure it's, it's about whether they're uh, Italian or whether they're Eastern European or whether they're Hispanic. I think it's more about the country that, in which they're arriving. That's an interesting, uh, an interesting point. Um, I would say I, I think that Rubio's rhetoric about immigration and the American dream uh, is, is pertinent and ought to be a message that Republicans champion, and especially when it comes to attempts to do outreach to, uh, to immigrants. Mm -hmm. Let me just say, though, on putting aside substance and policy and, and what's right, and as you know, I've written for years about why conservatives ought to embrace uh, more Hispanic immigrants from a, from a policy or substantive standpoint. But there right, is a, right. pol a political point, too. I mean, the concern is obviously that all these immigrants are going to vote Democratic. And I would argue the question is, do you want to take a short-term hit now or do you want to take a long-term hit in the future? I, I have the sense that the world is changing, that America is changing, and that um, there are going to be more and more Hispanics in America and um, that it's vital for the Republican Party for, from a political standpoint, putting aside all the salutary benefits that I believe would come anyway, but solely from a political standpoint, that it's vital that the Republican Party not be branded as a xenophobic, know-nothing party. And if they fight this, or if they kill immigration reform, and it goes down, you know, in flames, and it'll be the perception is that Republicans will have caused it. My concern is that they, yes, in the short term, it might be fine for Republicans, but they're sowing their seed to the seeds of long-term extinction. And perhaps I, my, my view on this is that parties come and go and that I'm, I'm not terribly, I, I think, as are you, that I'm not terribly tied to the Republican Party, that I, I mostly want to see the broad conservative principles win over time. And that if, if that comes with the Republican Party, that's great. But if that means that a new party has to be created to do that, um, sort of a, a so be it question. Uh, the way, I'm try, the way I, I want to approach this is to consider that realistically we've We've already had the, the great wave of Hispanic, mostly Mexican immigration that's probably done. Mexico has an economy that's growing very nicely, a society that's aging, that's becoming more broadly prosperous. Once they figure out this drug war, once um, they'll be in a position where we're not going to see much more net migration from Mexico. And the, the future waves are going to come from, from um, highly populated uh, dynamic countries in Africa, highly populated countries in, in um, Southern Asia, for instance, for really or Pakistan, Nigeria, Ghana. That's where the, the future waves are going to come from. It's one, I'm, I'm heartened that they have E-Verify. I wish they, they I wish they pushed E-Verify up much, considerably faster. I think um, giving that seven to 10 year window is, is far too long. And I know personally what I would do is I would find a way to become a prov provisional immigrant and get here, say, and I don't really care about the citizenship part. Let's just, if I can get that, if I can get a green card, we're good. Um, that's the, the way I kind of look at it. and. I, I don't think it's a, a no-nothing perspective to to continue to have a conservative party that demands that we have some broad right to determine who can legally come here, who can legally work here, um, and uh, who is eligible to become an American citizen. So it's kind of a it's going to be a big question for conservatives, and I'm not right. sure how we're going to figure that out. No, it's 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 a very difficult one. And I just, you mentioned Asians, and I think that's a prime example of the branding problem, which is to say that uh, Asians. You know, a lot of people would argue ought to be conservative, and yet they voted against you know, 
they voted for Obama. Um, and I think, I suspect that has to do with the branding problem that the Republican Party has perceived, rightly or wrongly, perceived as an anti-immigrant party. And so people are, over, are willing to vote against their values and, and in fact, their own self, economic self-interest um, in some cases in order to, uh, you know, for, because the Republican Party is just unacceptable. Well, I'm not so, so sure. Uh, I, I think a, a small piece of me thinks that, that what we saw in the last two elections was um, not a mirage, but probably a, a one-hit wonder, and that he, that Obama managed to assemble an electoral coalition unlike any we've ever seen. He's together um, the young um, ethnic minorities and, and women. Um, and if you look at those kind of, if you look at those type of voters, Voters, if you look at young women, for instance, young women who are single and independent, there are going to be ways in which they're going to like some government services. And there's ways in which young people in general are going to say, why are we spending six or seven times as much on, on elderly people as we do on our young? That, and that's the question that, uh, that Obama has taken up and that has, has been a, a fairly a forceful advocate for. I think most of his uh, proposed solutions are quite wrong. The problem is, is that there is no Republican uh, there's no, there, there seems to be a complete vacuum of Republican ideas in that field. <laughs> well, so he, is, by, by default, he's won. Right. But the thing is, I, I agree with you that uh, he has put together an interesting coalition. And I think I also agree with you that he may be unique. I mean, could could Joe Biden have pulled off what Obama did? I mean, he's a charismatic figure. But here's the irony. The one person that I believe could do that on the right is Marco Rubio, whom we are now in the process of destroying. Well, we will. I think we'll, we'll see what happens on immigration. It, I, I, I will, uh, in my immigration um, rant, by simply saying that I'm glad that they gave it uh, quite a bit of time to be read and debated before it goes to the floor. I, I think for, if absolutely nothing else, um, in the last three years we've managed to get rid of earmarks, which were a, a which were polluting the legislative process, and we've managed to to force after the Obamacare debacle. Um, us to allow uh, bills to be read and uh, vigorously debated in public before they ever reach the floor of Congress. So that's a very good thing. So I will give kudos for that if I'm not as much of a fan of the bill itself. All right, well, uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago when we were talking about immigration, uh, about, about immigrants uh, coming to America, not assimilating, um, not maybe not having an opportunity that they once had uh, to rise up, the mm. American dream. And it's a pretty good tie-in, I think, to uh, what I want to talk about in terms of the Boston bombing story. Um, obviously, we've had now a week to uh, digest what happened, and we've learned a little bit. We still obviously don't know everything, but we've learned a little bit. And um, I was hesitant to opine too much or speculate too much in the immediate days, and certainly hours and even days following the bombing, but I think now we've had enough time. And one thing, there seems to be this fight taking, this narrative fight taking place between those people who want to pretend that radical Islam had nothing to do with the bombing, and those people who want to like pretty much solely blame radical Islam. And I uh, am somewhere in the middle. I think that um, that no, there's no doubt that they were like inspired by this radical ideology uh, and theology to to do this horrific terrorist act. But I think you could ask, why were they susceptible? Um, now, clearly they were Chechen, but so was their uncle who called them losers. Why were they susceptible? And there have been some interesting uh, things written. Um, there's a guy named Tom Rogan, who is a colleague of mine of the week, who, uh, who wrote some interesting things about the alienation, um, and you should read him at Tom Rogan Thinks. And there was a really interesting piece at the Daily Beast, um, a guy named Christopher Dickey, uh, who wrote this piece. And uh, he, he comes up with the different arguments for why they were susceptible. And he says, first, testosterone. Almost all of the people who carry out terrorist attacks are young men. And um, I think that's true. I think that it's true not only because of testosterone, but because young people have this sort of, uh, they're susceptible to romantic, quixotic notions, uh, delusions of grandeur. Uh, the prefrontal cortex hasn't fully developed. I mean, I, I think that we underestimate this. 
But what say you, Justin? You're a young man, well, and I'm, you have I'm not, not as far as I know, done anything horrific. Sure. Totally, I'm going to totally agree with the uncle that they were, in fact, losers. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, 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 I think too, the bigger too. mystery is the younger brother, um, who, I, I don't know, we're going to find out more, but who, from initial reports, his classmates talked about how he was a kind of a, a casual stoner, a feel-good guy. I mean, clearly these uh, people had an incorrect impression of him, uh, but he seemed to have far better assimilated into society than his older brother, who, as, as we saw... Um, couldn't get a citizenship because he hit his girlfriend and then blamed, um, I, I think the way, the way it was, is that the, he blamed, his family blamed American culture for thinking that it was not okay to hit a woman. So that was a little bit of an assimilation problem. Well, the older brother had a wife who was supporting him. Right, well, he had a wife and a daughter. 80 hours and, a week or something. Well, and also um, their, their family uh, was receiving welfare benefits in the state of Massachusetts, so it was a... That's, I suppose that's not a, a great way to treat it. I, I am kind of um, confused. So part of the reason I think the younger men are more susceptible to, or or just are more likely to do terrible things like this, is that they don't. Is it the, the the is the alienation factor? Is that they don't have a lot of attachments that would convince them that what they're doing is a terrible idea? Um, the guy has a w wife and kid, and got him and then went off and killed people and ended up dead, le abandoning his family essentially. So that's one of the yeah, One of the profile the, things where you normally would say like, oh well, I mean he he's a suicide. He basically was a, a suicide terrorist. He was an idiot. Uh, but I don't know. I think, I think Western I think Western society in America specifically doesn't ask much of people. We don't we don't summon people to do to make sacrifices. Um, we basically say this won't be that hard. Um, with the exception of the vast minority of young people who go off to fight our wars, we're not asked to sacrifice much. And I believe that there is a yearning that young people generally have. You know, there's this, there's this stereotype that young people are apathetic, and I think that's true to a certain degree. But I also think that there's this yearning to uh, be asked to do something big uh, for glory. And, um, and I think young people are susceptible to that. And that can be channeled in positive ways or horrifically evil ways. Um, there's a great book uh, called Dedication and Leadership by a guy named Douglas Hyde that I've quoted a few times. He was a communist who became a Catholic. And he wrote this book to teach Catholics um, how to be more effective, because he believed that the communists were going to win, you know, sort of like Whitaker Chambers, he was, he was leaving the winning side for the losing side, and he believed the communists were better, be, better uh, sort of organizationally, because they were, they inspired young people, and gave, and, and, and called them to do big things. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something uh, afoot here with, with sort of young people um, who are, uh, they're angry, they feel and, and, and I mean, I, I can, I can remember being young, and being um, vulnerable. And uh, obviously, the vast majority of young people never become terrorists. I don't want to give that impression, but I think that there is something. Again, the the, the common denominator, aside from religion, seems to be young men. And in fact, despite in spite of religion, the the common denominator of terrorists seem to be young men. I mean, there are exceptions, but that seems to be, if you were going to profile them, that you would look at young men. I, I once uh, dated this girl, and, and her dad told me, uh, and it was a little bit scary, actually, but he told me that if it were up to him, he would incarcerate men from the age of 15 to 25, because <laughs> that's when 99% of the crimes take place. I'm like, okay, uh, good to see you. We're going to go out now. Yeah, uh, nice to meet you. I will never speak to you again. <laughs> Yes, but there's truth. That, there's truth to that. There is. Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, young men are. We're, we're I suppose, we're a um, impetuous, violent bunch. And that's kind of embedded in us. That's me. That's that's the natural response. This is the age Not when. This is. I mean, this is the age when men were historically asked to be soldiers and hard laborers and to do right, a lot of things think, that are no longer expected of them. So yes, and 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 and. and there's this book, I think it's called Wild at Heart, about you know, what Christians, uh, it, it's about why 
men uh, men have been like feminized and and become docile, and, and that we have this urge to go out and do big things, and instead we're here blogging. But I think it's not just the sort of physicality of it. It's also that young men are susceptible, and you mentioned military, and I think the reason there's a reason why even in America why we when we draft people, you know, we don't want it's it's not we don't just want eighteen we don't just want eighteen year olds because they're in better physical shape, although that's part of it. We also want eighteen year olds because they will be more likely to kill if we tell them to, because they haven't experienced this life um, to the degree that someone thirty five might have second thoughts about that. That's quite fair. I'll give you that. I will have to give I think yeah, I will have to Partly because I'm not yet sure. Ne never had the experience of that, so hopefully never, you know, never will. Never will. Well, uh, the interesting thing, the many interesting things, but the one brother was uh, was not 18, right? The older brother was in his mid-20s and, as you said, was married. Uh, so that's young, but that's, that's not, you know, young, young. Right, right. So that he, as like as I mentioned, I like, think he's. I'm not sure what we're gonna we're, we're gonna learn from either one of them. It's it'll, it'll be interesting to see how things unfold. It'll be interesting to see what, what how much information his his brother ultimately um, gives up on his older brother, and, and we'll never know if that's if that's accurate, if that's correct. But um, I was hoping that we could perhaps talk a little bit up, up, about how um, about one of your favorite topics about. Uh, was how we historically view the Gipper. Oh yeah, let's do it. How and how and how different strains of conservatism attempt to, I suppose, to pull the legacy of the most popular Republican in the last half century, and how we attempt to, I don't know, to say like, this is the correct theological interpretation of what of what the great Reagan once said. And well, we can We frequently talk about Reagan here in the DMZ, and it is interesting because everybody calls themselves a Reaganon, right? So you could be Pat Buchanan or Marco Rubio, um, and you would still probably look to Reagan. And yet, obviously, that so so what what Reagan represents means different things to different people at this point. He belongs to the ages. Well, he belongs to the eighties, as I think is, is what I would. <laughs> Is perhaps look at it. Which are, but politics, I like that. Politics generally reflect the the challenges of the of the year in which they're, in which they take place. At least you would hope, I guess. Um, and like the, for instance, this morning, Bob Patterson, who was he used to he used to work in the in the White House. He's he's one of the the compassionate conservatives, I suppose. If you want to throw him a label or a thing, um, suggesting that the GOP makes a big mistake by um, by suggesting that Reagan was an avowed libertarian that he disdain government that he was um, a huge free trader and I think it's a it's an intriguing um, suggestion because it we, we really face a, a little problem which is that we have a middle class that is is stagnating I'm not sure I would call it disintegrating but which is in one way or the other a middle and working class that is in trouble uh, areas that used to be uh, core Republican constituencies that are well, perhaps that need more government help, or that need a government help in a different way than it's being provided now, and Republicans aren't quite sure how to advance that. And it that hits us when we're talking about entitlement reform. That hits us in what we view the government's uh, role in education and basic research. That hits us in how we look at infrastructure spending, even. And so, the next decade or two, um, I think we're going to have to fight this out again. I, I imagine we've probably fought it out before, but it's going to have to be round two or round three of what would Reagan do in the 21st century? Right. Well, it's hard to judge Reagan. Uh, be, it, it's a complex thing. I mean, on one hand, you could say, <clears throat> on one hand, Reagan, his hero was FDR. Um, he was a member of a union. And some of his rhetoric, he was very good at using rhetoric that um, was inclusive and communitarian, and um, you could be like an FDR New Deal Democrat and also support Reagan. And in fact, there were the Reagan Democrats. Um, so 
on one hand, you could argue, of course, what you're saying is true. On the other hand, I think you could make an argument that Reagan, um, that, that we're standing on the shoulders of Reagan. And he, because, because he was so much closer uh, to the New Deal and to the Great Society, he could only get away with being so conservative. That, that, that if Reagan lived today, uh, having, having built on the accomplishments of the Reagan administration, he could push America even further to the right, to be even freer, to embrace free markets even more. So, um, it, you know, it's unclear to me which of those two visions is, is correct. And I suspect that it's, uh, it's very complicated. So I, I would, I would leave it with the, with sort of the who the who wins question. Then, Republicans won the majority of the presidential elections between FDR and George Bush, and that we've lost the majority since. And that, the Republican Party that, sort of not maybe not had its peace with the the New Deal, but the Republican Party that seemed to, to sort of be for. I mean, Reagan raised, for instance, uh, payroll taxes to make the Social Security work again. Uh, a smart move. He, he basically put the, the program back on track for the next 50 years. Good. Uh, seemed to be pretty popular. And the Republican Party appealed to a lot of um, working class and middle class constituencies who wanted things that are qu uh, quite different than now, who were concern more concerned, say, about law and order than they were about, than they, um, than they, than we are today, and were concerned about like, genuinely high taxes than we are today. I think historically we have pretty good taxes uh, compared to, say, what the taxes were in in 1980, you know, you wrote a big piece this summer on how Reagan dramatically uh, reduced the tax the tax burden on most Americans. Good, uh, but we'll keep fighting this out. It's a right. Well, and, and also, but he also raised taxes 11 times, as as the other side would point out. Even though he dramatically reduced the uh, income tax rate, which I argue is is incredibly important. But I do want to say that I want to push, I read that Daily Beast piece, and I found it very interesting. It was posted, uh, guest posted uh, under your blog at the Daily Beast. But I do want to say, I think he pulled off an interesting sleight of hand. Um, mm. maybe, uh, well, maybe unintentionally. Uh, but his, he creates this paradigm where Reagan as it be, comes at the end of Republican uh, hegemony where essentially Republicans dominated electorally from, uh, for, you know, Ford, Nixon, Reagan, that Republicans from the 50s till the 80s won a lot of presidential elections. And I think that's true technically, but I think, it, but I think it's misleading. Because what happened was, I would argue that there was the era of FDR, which essentially lasted until Reagan. So yes, yes, Republicans like Nixon and Eisenhower won presidential elections, but it didn't matter that much in the sense that they were still living in the world that FDR created. They were either managing the welfare state that he created or the New Deal. They really weren't rolling back anything. And we know that Nixon like created the EPA and all sorts of things, uh, uh, liberal you know, bureaucracies. And then Reagan came in, and I would argue that he started the era of Reagan which I think has just ended. It ended when Barack Obama was elected, but it included Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton had eight years, but it was still, he was living in the era of Reagan. So Clinton had to say the era of big government is over, things like that. So um, I, I think that it's misleading uh, to, to argue that, that Republicans, you know, or conservatism was, you know, winning in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And it, that's, yeah, winning Republican, Republicans winning presidential elections isn't the point. It's about what ideology is the dominant force in, in our society. And so I think that um, that's a misleading uh, point in that column. The big question, the one that we can always argue the historical details, but the big question is like, what, uh, what form of government are Americans going to prefer going into the future? And it seems that Reagan laws of Pull back to, I guess, like the 30,000 feet view, the, the way that Eric Erickson likes to go once in a while. The reason Reagan was so broadly successful and is remembered by so many for so many good things today is that in the 1970s, it was possible. The government regulated bridges, 
airports. The government, I mean, the government regulated the way we we would move foodstuffs around. They, it was a far more uh, structured government-centric life than it is today. Right. And Reagan peeled those things back, and that was one of the reasons he was so broadly successful was because he dramatically reduced the government's involvement in people's lives. Uh, but what we're seeing now is a pushback against that. So, the, 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 so I think the big question we have is we is we try to uh, was like build a political structure for the next 20, 30, 40 years, for the next few generations in this 21st century, is, is it going to look more like what FDR wanted, or is it going to look more like what we had in the Reagan, Clinton, Bush years? Well, that's the big one. That's how that's we try big, to do one. That's a big question, and it's probably a good place for us to stop. But first, uh, give us some plugs. How can people keep up with you? I tweet probably too much. Um, I've, <laughs> yeah, I've, I think you may, actually. Or, <laughs> so I've heard. I, I'm pretty prolific. I, I like. I tweet at jgreendc. I... Like I said, I, I write for the Daily Beast. We write a lot too. Um, it's fun, and I uh, yeah, I occasionally appear here on Blogging Heads. It's a fun right. thing. Excellent. Well, Justin, thank you for uh, filling in for Bill, who is on assignment. And uh, thank right, you it was for it was fun to have an all Republican DMZ. <laughs> it, I think it's what the viewers really deserve. This is what they've been clamoring for, That's right? The DMZ. So thank you for doing it, and. Uh, until next time, folks, we have you covered here inside the...